Welcome to EP Daily. Today on the show, we attempt to find out why Fantastic Four wasn't so fantastic in the rundown. Plus, Jose revisits the legacy of the classic Mega Man games. And then we get you up to date with the latest content for Splatoon. Also coming up, Scott has some undead Norse mythology with zombie Vikings. Ben and Jose take us to space with a review of Galaxy and much more today on EP Daily. Brought to you by EB Games. I'm your host, Victor Lucas, bringing you the latest and everything cool every single day. The only thing better than a shower and a hot cup of coffee to wake you up in the morning is the rundown. The new Wachowski series, Sense8, is being reborn. Netflix has officially renewed the show for a second season. Sense8 premiered exclusively on the streaming service in June, but there was some doubt about whether or not it would get a second order given its polarizing reception. Netflix also has a history of renewing its shows much sooner than this, so that could indicate that they may have been on the fence. Sense8 tells the story of eight different people from all over the world whose lives become connected telepathically with plenty of Wachowski-style philosophy and social commentary thrown in. Expect the new season to start streaming next year. <laughs> There's a bit of finger pointing about who's to blame for the new Fantastic Four movie. The film, which was supposed to reboot the comic book characters, hit theaters earlier this month and was a box office bomb. It was also panned by critics, including yours truly, and received an abysmal C- cinema score from audiences. Director Josh Trank has implied that it's the studio's fault. In a quickly deleted post on Twitter, he claimed that the studio took the film away from him and made big changes, and that his original version would have been much better. On the other hand, Fox claims that they respected his vision for the film, which is another way of saying that it's his fault. The studio says that they're still committed to the characters and franchise, so we'll just have to wait and see what the future holds. You guys sure you're in the best shape to be doing this? Oh, yeah. 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 Some pretty wonderful news in the rundown today. Here to help me talk about that is Brissa Roberto and some not so wonderful news with Fantastic Four. Well. Not surprising that there's gonna be a little hubbub after the uh, dismal showing of that film over its opening weekend. And congratulations, everybody that didn't see it. Yeah, yes. there's quite the hubbub about yes. this one. I kind of like it, but I also make, it makes me feel really sad uh, for the people involved that actually really put their heart it's into so it. It's so catty. Uh, it is so catty. Right? It's so catty, and I hate it, and I hate they're playing the blame game now and pointing the fingers. Yeah. Like, you know what? Who? I want to know who did it for sure, but I want somebody to take ownership of this. Yeah. Who do you think should take the fall? Uh, listen, that tweet that Josh Trank sent out was terrible. Oh. And, yeah, I think that's an awful thing to say. I think if you're a director of something, yeah. you just support your movie and you support your work. He's got his name on it. He could have taken his name but off of it if he protested that that's much. That's true. One thing we're all in agreement with, though, what? is that the uh, the movie sucked. And uh, oh, yeah, it the deserves the dismal box oh. office and it deserves to be forgotten as quickly as possible. Yeah, for sure. Now, I'm really glad that we've got some different news with Sense8 because okay. it didn't know, I didn't know if they were going to do this or not. It did, felt like uh, Netflix was like, hmm. I didn't think it was going to happen at yeah, all. You didn't I, like the show. I didn't really like it as much as you did. I like the theme of it, yes. definitely, but some people might say, I'm not saying that I'm saying this, but maybe I am, that the Wachowskis had a fluke at the Matrix. So. Uh, no, I think they're they are they are artists, yeah. and they are always trying to. Uh, they don't always hit it out of the park. Yeah. Jupiter ascending, okay. uh, but they try, and I I like okay. and I admire the trying of things, and I also like the attempt to uh, make this an international phenomenon, and and to work with all of these disparate elements to create something that we have never seen on television before. Yes, the ensemble is interesting for yeah. sure. And it is a, it is a, it's a large feat. Yeah. And I can't say they've accomplished what they set out to do, mm -hmm. but maybe with the second season they might. Yeah, I think this is cool. I and mean, I like the serialized tone of this as well. Mm -hmm. I like the, the, the connective tissue and the kind of lost kind of connections that it has as well. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is gonna turn out to be a really cool, compelling series when it all is said and done. So everybody's gotta watch season two. But but right now we've got to watch something on Mega Man Legacy Collection. Mega Man is coming at us, the Legacy Edition. Okay, first of all, Mega Man is really hard. I'm not sure how much harder this game could possibly be, but now you're coming at us with all the Mega Man games? These are all the Mega Man games that came out on the 8-bit systems on the NES. It's Mega Man 1 through 6. Uh, this is really our, our attempt to archive not just the historical game, but the art. The, the feeling, the nostalgia that's all around Mega Man. And we want to basically preserve it 
in this pristine condition and in super sharp 8-bit uh, graphics so that when you go into new systems, it'll just look just as well. We were actually approached by the developer Digital Eclipse and they had this really cool technology that was able to recreate and rebuild an NES game really fast and really accurate. So that's why we're doing this. They came to us with the right technology to do this. Let's talk about the actual games that we're getting in this yes. and why they're so important. Yeah. So, I mean, as all gamers know that, you know, Mega Man is very important to the history of, of video games. And it's been so long and there's been so many different versions and emulations. And there's nothing out there that's really authentic to the, how the gameplay was before. So what this is really recreates that feeling of all, all of the glitches, all of the little cheats that you knew, the bugs, all the good parts and the bad parts are all going to still be there. This is going to play exactly like the NES versions did. The only thing that's going to really look different is that the game is going to look super sharp because they're re-outputting it in 1080. Holy smokes. So you guys didn't change anything at all? There's not going to be an easier setting for me? No, no, no easier settings. What? Well, so we did, we did do one thing that, that and I know people are either going to love or hate, but there is one save slot in the game. So say you're about to get to fight Cutman, but you're on your last life and you don't want to die and have to start all over again, you can do a save state, but that's only for those that really need to do it. But if, if you're a hardcore guy or like it's just not your thing, you don't have to use it at all. But aside from that, you know, we're also offering a lot of other cool features. We have a museum with over a thousand pieces of art that you may not have ever seen before. A cool database give you like a history about all the different characters and what their background is, as well as the new challenge mode. The challenge mode would be really cool. It's think of it as remixing up all the different parts of Mega Man one through six and a theme challenge that way you have a time and we support that with leaderboards and replays as well. I am excited for it because I know that a lot of fans are going to be excited about this, yeah. and I'm excited for them, the Mega Man fans. Yeah. But do you feel like this? Is this something that newcomers will enjoy, can actually pick up and play? Yeah, I mean, if you like platform games, because there, there are a lot of games nowadays that continue on the difficulty and the spirit of Mega Man games. If you like platform games in general, I think this is something that you really want to check out. This is one of the games where the roots of platforming came from. Mega Man Legacy Collection comes out August 25th, and of course it was supposed to go head to head with Mighty Number no. 9, but we know that's been delayed a little mm -hmm. bit. Now. Well, guess what, Victor Lucas Splatoon just got a big update, and we've got a review after this. Welcome back. Daily. You know, Marissa, everyone around the EP set these days yeah. has Splatoon fever. Maybe it was something they ate. Oh, yeah, we got the fever, and it was probably something that I ate too. But yeah, it's a free update from Nintendo. It's kind of a big deal, so we wanted to give it some attention. Yeah, here's Vic and Marissa with the review. It's been a little while since Marissa and I took a look at Splatoon yeah. for the first time, and part of Nintendo's strategy was to use the summer to keep upgrading and updating. Version 2.0 is where we're at as of this recording. This is a fascinating game for us to go back to because what we had to play before we reviewed it the first time was the journalist-only version of the game, which was the full game, but it was only with the groups of people that were out there that were all, all reviewing it at the same time together. So that meant we got a new version version of the game and we had to start from scratch yeah. and level up again because right. I really haven't gone back to Splatoon. A couple times I played it but not sure, to well, level up. we have a lot of games to play yeah, because Lucas. our job is to review a million For things. For sure, but the game is so fun and I yeah. love that we're getting to dive back into it because this is the perfect excuse now. This yes. huge update which we're getting here. Yes, you have to be really level 20 to start feeling all of these all things. All of the stuff, yeah. Yeah, because you have different upgrades and different weapons here which are really cool and I'm seeing other people in the stages when I'm jumping in using them. I'm like, well, I want that bucket. <laughs> I want that bucket too, man. And they work so well. They cover so much ground. It's the thing that everybody's like, holy crap, this makes so much sense. I know, and everybody's using it now. I mean, you do have the Gatling gun in there as well, but yeah. the bucket, man, oh, because that's it the thing about Splatoon. It sucks to get killed by that bucket it does. over and over and it over does, again. It does, but yep. that's the thing about Splatoon, though. You see the people, when you're playing online now, you see uh, how people just play the game so differently, because yeah. people will attack you and just want to shoot you down and kill you, but really the whole point of it is to cover as much ground as possible. Yeah. So when these guys come at you and just try to kill you, it's so frustrating, and then you end up respawning spawning back again. There are so many frustrating moments while playing this game. There's so much fun though that overshadows all of that. Yeah. So just jumping in and talking and learning the new stages or getting updates from Callie and Marie, yeah. they're very annoying. Yeah. They're, they're so can't annoying. Skip em. You can't skip them. And then yeah. when you go to upgrade or purchase anything, you can't skip all the conversations. You yeah. have to press A to get through it. Which Those are, are just annoying, tedious things. They are for us. 
I think yes. for most people that are just losing themselves in this Nintendo experience and they've got the time to just enjoy it, it's different when you're reviewing these things because there, there is a time crunch factor. Yeah. We gotta get back to report to you guys. And when you can't skip stuff, it's frustrating. It is frustrating. I think they're cool. I like Callie and Yeah, Marie. I like all the charm and all the fishy, squiddy references yeah. that everybody has. I think all of that <gasps> all world. <laughs> This it's is so much fun. one of the best Nintendo games out there. Holy you know, smokes. It really is a fantastic game. And there aren't tons of you know, brand new Wii U titles this summer. We know that, but this, this, this is it. This, this is makes, great. This makes the Wii U for the summer for yeah. me, for sure. What are you giving the new update for Splatoon? I'm going up, man. It's a better game. Ooh. It still needs to have the voice chat, but it gets a 9 out of 10 for me. <laughs> yeah, this game's a 9 for sure. You can start splashing buckets filled with paint all over your friends' territory right now. Download it, it's free. Moving right along, what if you took a Viking and you coupled that Viking with a zombie and you would have zombie Vikings? I found out the latest about this game in this interview. I'm with Klaus Lingelet. He is the director of a game called Zombie Vikings. He also previously worked on a game called Stick It to the Man, so you know his work probably. Klaus, tell me what's new and different in Zombie Vikings? Well, I think with, with Zombie Vikings, we wanted to try to do something that's really action-based. We wanted to do an action game. And as an indie developer, you want to try to do something new, and we had done their puzzle adventure game, and now we just really wanted to see if we could do a brawler where there's four players and you really have fun together. We looked a lot at other brawlers and we saw that people weren't really working together in a way. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do a way where people actually pull in and try to work together. We have, for example, a way that you can merge all your zombies into one giant zombie that you can control together. That's so cool. you get one leg, you get another leg, and one gets an arm and one gets to shoot little bullets out of his head. So it's just trying to really have fun with that theme. <laughs> Obviously, the creatures here are Vikings before they become zombies. Right. What sort of behaviors do the creatures in the game have that uh, would maybe be authentic to the Viking experience? I don't think they really have. The way we went out with it was basically, we would use Norse mythology as a background, mm -hmm. but it's almost more like, what if Napoleon Dynamite would come up with a game about Vikings, you know? So mm -hmm. it's just like, he doesn't know anything, but he would just make it up. And that's how this is done too. So it uses some of the classic stuff, it's like Odin, Loki is in there. Mm -hmm. But then the character itself, we tried to put a lot of effort into actually building characters. You know, see in Castle Crashers, for example, that the characters are quite simple. I mean, it's really just focused on gameplay, but we also really want to put a lot of effort into building the characters. Mm -hmm. For example, we have Sigurd, which is like part squid, part man. Mm -hmm. He was actually merged together with the squid in Welha. So what he can do is he has this head little squid inside his stomach and they become friends and sort of like that. But she could get really angry at the squid and when she gets angry, his body basically rips in two parts and he, she sort of comes out like a giant crackerish monster. Each character has a special abilities but also have a background story that's different. And that's one of the things you explore during the gameplay. It starts out with a simple story where you have to try to get the eye back from Loki who stole it from Odin. Not my good eye! Sucker! It seems like there's a big emphasis on multiplayer here. Can you also play the game by yourself if you don't want to have friends to play with like me? Yeah, but you could, you could, of course. I mean, I think the weird thing is that if you play four player, the game's get quite chaotic and it's quite fun when it's really chaotic. If you play two player, you can make more strategic moves. Like we have one move, for example, where you can stab your friends, pull them up and throw them. Yes! Use them as a weapon. And when you're two players, you can sort of organize it more, more strategic moves. So that that's quite fun. Mm -hmm. Once you go down to one player, then you don't have all these other guys sitting in the couch screaming, and having fun. So you can sort of listen to the story, get more into that, look at the environment, figure out all the little side quests and do all those extra puzzles that's in there. Mm -hmm. We think it's still the most fun if you play it two or well, up to four players. So you've made games before, obviously, Stick It to the Man. What were some of the biggest challenges in making Zombie Vikings? I think it was for us to go from a puzzle adventure game, which had some moves, so were quite simple to code in a way. Now we had to do real action gameplay. We realized that it's just little finesses of old animation, how the character moves, how to make the perfect attack movement. All these parts, are, they look really simple, but it's really complicated. It has to feel really right when you press the buttons. Victory! Zombie Vikings comes out later this year. Don't go anywhere because after the break, Ben and Jose will be joining us with their review of Galaxy or Zed, wherever you're from.
Welcome back to EP Daily. One of my favorite teams on the show has always been Ben Silverman and Jose Sanchez. Well, they recently got together in San Francisco to shoot a video, and they said it was appropriate for television. Here's their review of Galaxy. Jose, it's been a great summer for Sony in terms of downloadable games. They've really picked it up. We've got Rocket League, we've got N++, and now we've got a game called Galaxy Z. Now, this is right up our alley. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah, no. Because this is, believe it or not, a roguelike. Roguelike space shooter. That's right. We what? love the, We love those things. I love them. We love Put both them of them those. together? Yeah. Can I get Galaxy Z? Yeah. Well, how did you feel turning this game on and playing it? I was excited, man. I love the hand-drawn art style. It looks like I'm playing an anime. It has that very classic, old-school TV anime Macross, feel. Macross. Yeah, kind of like right? Macross. Yeah. Nothing left to lose now. You play through episodes. Each of the levels is based on a season, and there's five episodes in a season, so you have to get through all of them without dying. Which is the painful part? It is very painful. So like, I die at the end every time. Yeah. Like, oh. like any roguelike game, this is about starting from scratch, getting as far as you can, and then starting over again and kind of taking what you've learned. And you do make very, very, very small incremental advancements by playing through it. Sure. Hey, I've reached a big asteroid, and there's definitely a cave system. Looks dark inside. Well. Go in and keep reporting. So basically, as you play through Galaxy and you kill enemies and you discover lots of different things, you discover, among other things, blueprints. And those blueprints get saved to the shop. So when you start over a new game and you are going to die and you're you going to start over again, you now have access to more weapons and stuff and different items that you can get right from the start. Now, you still need cash. And to get cash from the start means you have to collect these crash coins, or what they're called. And they're kind of random and rare to find them. Yeah. But as you start to acquire those, those then get kind of exchanged right at the beginning of a new round. And you've got some cash and some cool weapons. And that's how you start off more badass than the last time. And it's true. I mean, you can go around. And just the exploration factor alone is pretty cool. Because you're like, all right, I'm just flying through space. You see some shrapnel, some broken ships. You start shooting it away. You're like, yeah, I got some cash. Mm -hmm. Give me the coins, give me the coins. And then you go into like the heart of the level, which is usually some sort of circular world that you're traversing through and you get a little map, kind of tells you where you need to go and what you need to save or what you need to do. But that changes every time, which is, this is right, you know, spunky that's, style. That's the roguelike that's part, the rogue right? This, these are procedurally generated levels, which is a little confusing because we mentioned how it's also sort of a, a television series. It's, it plays out like episodes. And there is a story element to it where at the beginning of every mission, you'll be told where you're going to go in there and you're going to kill sure. some of the big bugs or you got to go find some supplies or whatever. And there's actually a little bit of scripting to each one of these levels. And certainly the end of each season, there are four seasons currently, there's another fifth one coming. At the end of each of these seasons, you have a big boss fight and that's all scripted as well. Yeah. So it's procedural in the sense that the design of each level is going to change every yeah. time you play it. But the overarching sort of plot that's happening is pretty consistent. Destroy. And that's mine. In this game, Everything takes a long time. This is a 30, 40 hour kind of roguelike in terms of really unlocking stuff. That's the interesting thing about Galaxy is that it's not exactly the game it looks like it is. Like you're looking at it right now and it looks like, oh, I'm just gonna fly around and just blast everything yeah. and kick everyone's ass. Seems simple. You have to learn to not do that. You have to teach yourself to like avoid enemies because it turns out if you get into too many of these firefights, you will die, you are under equipped. And yeah. there's a lot of kind of using physics and inertia to kind of thrust a little bit and then float past yeah. some dudes the, and like try to sneak around. slow and low, man. If you thrust too much, there's this little expanding uh, radar that comes out that basically will tell other ships, it's like a noise meter. Yeah. You're making too much noise, they're gonna come after you. It's really interesting. It turns into more of a stealth roguelike than just the space combat roguelike. Especially for me, like I would see a spot an enemy and you're like, okay, I just came from this vicinity. I'm gonna shoot at him and I'm gonna thrust back and I'm gonna blow him up. But then when you're out in the thralls of space, you're just like, I don't know what to expect. You start blasting away the guy and you're reversing. All of a sudden, these enemies come from behind. You're like, oh god, now which way do I go? I don't have crazy guns that are blasting off everything. You're dead. It's super well done. It's really crafted with a lot of love and care. I don't know if it's going to be a game for everybody, but I think it's certainly a game people have to try, right? I'm definitely with you, my friend. You know, I love me some roguelikes. I love me some space shooters. And when the two merge together, you get Galaxy. What are you going to give Galaxy? I'm giving Galaxy an 8 out of 10. I'm giving it an 8 out of 10 myself. Give it a try. Be careful. Be careful out there. Be careful. Oh, God damn it, Jose. I just died. Thanks, boys. Galaxy is out now on the PS4 and the PC. And don't go anywhere, because coming up next, we've got the Twitter question of the day after this.
If you want more EP, go to our website, epn.tv, for bonus content and full episodes. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to EP Daily. It is now time for the best part of today's show. This is a Twitter question of the day. This one comes from Charlie Powerhouse. Lovely. He's at Powerhouse Posse. <laughs> Want to join that posse, Charlie? Uh, he said, with the latest iteration of FF lacking the fantastic factor, right. who do you think could give us a real fantastic four? The Powerhouse Posse sounds like they should face off against the fantastic four. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, but uh, the director that I'm thinking of for this franchise would be Doug Lyman, mm. who's proven, who's versatile. He's done all kinds of great kind of spy stuff with the Born Identity and action stuff, Mr. Nice. and Mrs. Smith, Edge of Tomorrow, oh, sci-fi, yeah. uh, and also real character stuff like Swingers and That's Go. Weird. This guy's incredible. I think he would do a phenomenal job and they should set it in the 60s, the mm -hmm. birth of uh, of uh, the Marvel superhero age. Look at his brain. That'd be great. I love that. So Joss Whedon's too easy then? Too busy. Oh, and too I think easy he, and too busy. Probably a little uh, sort of overdone with superheroes for a little bit. Good question, right. Charlie. Yeah. If you want to ask us a question or get caught up on the show, hit up our website, epn.tv. We've got more coming for you the next episode of EP Daily, including a look at Hitman, Agent 47, the new movie. Thanks for watching. Bye. EP would like to thank its sponsors, Nintendo, Xbox. EP's mobile coverage is brought to you by Gameloft, makers of Asphalt 8 Airborne, which you can play on your Android or iOS device for free right now. You, my friend, are a riddle to me. Because I've run your face and your prints through every database we have. You know what we found? Nothing. So, why don't we start with your name? 47. It's not a name. No, but it is mine.